online. We're so glad you're with us. I shared before, but I'll say again, we're kicking off. Uh, what I'm so excited about 2021 uh, for, for lots of reasons. Most of all, that God is King and Lord, and whatever we face and go through, He's with us. But we're going to be walking on our nights of worship, our first Wednesday of every month like this, uh, hopefully sooner than later, indoors. Uh, but for now, we're, we're, we're where we are. But we're going to be talking about this idea, what's in a name? You know, what's in a name? Does a name really matter? As people, you know, you, you, if, you, if you're a, a parent, you have, you have a child, and you, you, know, you kind of, oh, God, you know, she, she looks like a Kimberly. We'll call her Kimberly. Uh, oh, he looks like a Brad. We kind of we'll come up with names, and we can give a kid a name that may not have a whole lot of meaning to it, but it's, it's meaningful because that's their name. That's what we call them by. Uh, but in the ancient world, it was different. Names had a lot more meaning than they do today. But even now today, a lot of our names have meaning. A lot of your names have a story behind them. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share two stories right now out of my own name that you might know or might not know, but they're kind of interesting about my name. And I'm going to invite you, if you're in the courtyard, after the service to go back and see Thomas at the top of the stairs and tell him like in 30 seconds on film something interesting about your name. If you've got a story about your first name, middle name, last name, we want to collect those, videotape them. If you're at home, uh, you're going to see it. It's just going to say Thomas at shoreline.church. You can film yourself, 30, 60 seconds, send it to Thomas, and we're going to share those online through the whole year. Just talk about what's in the name. So here's my name. This is my name. I am Kevin Garth Harney. Kevin Garth Harney. Some of you might have known me before. I didn't know your middle name was Garth. Were your parents like country music fans? Well, Garth Brooks was born in 1962, and so was I. So I'm probably not named after him, right? Uh, I, you know, I... We're, we're the same age. I'm named Garth for a very different reason. My dad's best friend and younger brother was Garth. That was his, his younger brother's name, and he was, he was his best friend. And my dad uh, lost his brother in his late teenage years in a car accident. And I think that's part of the reason that for over 40 years that I shared Jesus with my dad, he held back. I think he wondered, how could God let that happen? But I was named Garth, not after Garth Brooks. I was named Garth after Garth, his younger brother. And every time I saw my granny growing up, my dad's mom, she'd look at me and she'd say, oh, Kevin, you look more and more like Garth every day. And I took that as a, as a compliment, but it was kind of strange because I'd never met him and I'd saw pictures of him. But my middle name, Garth, there, there, there's meaning in a name. There's a story behind my name. There's, you know, what's in a name? Well, for me, there's a whole family history there. My last name, Harney. Well, what's in a name? You might not know this. Harney's not my name. I have no Harney blood in me. Never have, never will. So then, how, then why are you called Kevin Garth Harney? Because my dad was Robert Terrence McGargy. And his father was a committed Irish drunk. He was an alcoholic. And he ran out on the family, abandoned them, and they found him dead in the gutter in New York City. My, my dad didn't know his dad. I never met my, my grandpa because he died before, when my dad was a young boy. And so my, my dad's mom remarried, but her husband never adopted my dad, never gave my dad his name. So my dad is Robert Terrence McGargy, but he started going by Harney on non-legal documents because he didn't like his family name because of his dad's history. And so we, Sherry and I found out when we had my dad sign a legal document, when he wrote it, Robert Terrence McGargy, I said, Dad, why aren't you putting Harney? He says, well, I can't write that on legal documents. I'm not actually, and he gave me the whole family history. What's in a name? A lot. So me, I'm Kevin Garth McGargy. <laughs> I'm an Irish boy. But I go by Harney because that's what was given to me. Names mean something. In the ancient world, in the ancient world, names had huge meaning. Your name was, was really part of your character. If, 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 if somebody says, uh, that person has a good name, what does that mean? Oh, that's, that's a clever name. No, what does it mean? It means they have a good name, they have good character, they have good, they, as a person, they, they, they have, it speaks to their, to their value, to their attributes, to who they are, to their heart, to their commitments. And if you slander someone's name, such as they're making fun of their name, what are you making fun of? Them. You're slandering their name, who they are. And the ancient world names held that kind of meaning. And so as we walk through this year, as we look at different names for God, we're, we're going we're to learn a lot of things. This is kind of our journey of 2021 on, on Wednesday evenings, is to really discover different names of God. But, but why? Why would we do that? I'll give you some reasons. To understand and kind of be introduced to different names for God. Some you'll be familiar with. Some you'll say, I never thought of God in those terms, or I didn't know that name for God. We're going to celebrate those names. 
You may have noticed the theme in the songs that we sang and that we'll sing after communion in a little bit about just God's name and who he is and his character. We're going to celebrate God by thinking about his name. We're going to learn more about our God as we get to know his name. If you really understand that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, if you understand that, it tells you something about his character, his power. But it also tells you about where he is right now and his power in your life. And so we're going to learn more about God by learning about his names. And then I'm going to challenge you to pray the names of God, to start praying God's name in a meaningful manner. Most of us may pray, we'll say, dear Lord. We're kind of like, like, like our, it's like our, our diving board that we launch into prayer. Well, dear Lord or Heavenly Father. And, and that's how we always go into prayer. Would you pray differently if you began your prayer like this? You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the first and the last. You are the beginning and the end. And you move into prayer. It has a little different feeling to it, doesn't it? Be- because you're talking about who God is. And so we're going to dig into to that name for God, but, but we're going to also through this year, we're going to look at God as the advocate. What does it mean to say that God is our advocate, that he is, he is the paraclete, which is the, the comforter, the one who comforts us in all of our afflictions? What does that mean? That he is the great I am, that he is Emmanuel, that he's Jehovah Shalom and Jehovah Jireh, God my peace, God my provider, that he is the Logos, the great word, that he is our Father. Every name of God draws us closer into his presence. And so our Father, great comforter, shepherd of the sheep, teach us this year. Let us not only know names that you bear, but what those names tell us about you and what those names tell us about us. God, if we call you the good shepherd, it tells us that we are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture, beloved, protected, watched over, provided for. Take us deep into who you are as we discover more and more about your name this year, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to dive into Revelation 23, 13. The entire text for tonight is one verse, and you probably already know what it is. In Revelation 23, uh, 22, 13, we read this. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and and the end. What, what do you discover about God? What do you learn about God when you look at this name, when you think about it? Well, the Alpha and the Omega, is, we, what we would say is God is the A to the Z. The Alpha and Omega are so the beginning and the end of the alphabet. It's, it's that God encompasses everything. Every word that you can think of begins with a letter between A to Z. Everything that describes God, that it's, it's all encompassed in that space. Our God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. And his arms are around everything. And if God's arms are around everything, his arms are around you. And his arms are around me. He's sufficient for all that we need. He watches over us. He surrounds us. He's the beginning and the end. Nothing is out of his purview. Nothing is out of his control. Nothing is out of his sovereign, watchful, loving eye. Do you need to be reminded today that nothing is out of God's sight? Because it's true. I'm hoping a lot of our folks that are at home uh, are are being part of the service and don't have a TV or something on your screen, a screen and screen with news right now. I would challenge you if you're doing that, turn the news off for now. Because you know what? It'll be bad later too. It'll still be there. The anxiety, the worry, it'll still be there. But what we need wrapped around whatever we walk through, your your doctor's diagnosis, to, to, to understand that he is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, even in that moment of news. When, when you watch our news right now and see what's going on, you say he is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is sovereign God. Over your finances, over your health, over your relationships, over a country, over a nation, over a world. He is God. And can I tell you something? The more we focus on the brokenness of the world, the more we forget who's sovereign over all. And, and every so often, we got to stop focusing here and just, and just look up and say, oh, Lord, I, I see who you are. Then we can look back at things. We don't ignore those things, but we look back with a whole new perspective. Do you know how many times in 2020 I said to this congregation, God is on the throne? 
The answer is 457. I kept track. No, I have no idea. But it was, it's got to be in the hundreds. Why do I say that? Because God is on the throne. We have to remember this because there's, there's crazy stuff going on. But God's still on the throne. No one pushes him off. And so I just want to think together about what it means to say that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, that he's sovereign over all things. Here's some of the things that we can know. From the womb to the grave, and for eternity, he's with you. From the womb to the end of life, to the grave and into eternity, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There is no part of that that God is not with you, is not there. Sherry and I were given permission recently to share with people uh, that our oldest son, Zach, who was a pastor here for five years, and his wife, Christine, are pregnant. God has been sovereign over their lives, but they've had a series of years and a series of really hard experiences uh, with infertility, coming to the point where they could finally, they've gone halfway through the pregnancy term, and the baby uh, seems healthy and everything's going well, and they said, we can finally kind of say, okay, now we can let people know. But they were waiting because they just didn't want, you know, because it had been kind of false start, false start. And then they're just saying, we don't know. But, but that little baby boy in Christine's womb, God's hand is on him. He's sovereign over it. We're allowed to say it's a boy, right? Okay, because I just did. Okay, good. We don't know the name. Not the name. Not the name. We do know the name. I don't want to lie, but you're not allowed to know that. But okay, but I'm not in trouble yet. Okay, I'll be careful. Uh, but I know that the hand of the sovereign God is upon that little guy. And that God has a plan for him. Like God said to Jeremiah, in your mother's womb, I had a plan for you. And all through life, God's hand is on us. And I was thinking about a woman who Sherry and I know and love dearly, uh, Lucille. And Lucille, um, she has had an amazing life living for Jesus. She is such a faithful, godly woman who just follows Jesus every day of her life. But she's lost her husband a number of years ago. Uh, she lost a daughter. She lost a granddaughter. She's gone through tremendous loss in her life. And there's, there's, there's a lot of evenings where she's home alone, and yet she's never alone. Because from the womb all through life, he's with us. And when I picture Lucille, and I can picture her, her on her farm in Byron Center, and I can picture where her table is by the window that looks out towards the kind of the work area where they had a steel shop there, and I can see Lucille there with her Bible talking to Jesus, never alone. By herself, oftentimes, never alone. Why? Because the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last is with her. I think of Jeff Taylor, and many of you know Jeff, who passed away just recently. A big part of this community, a part of Shoreline Church, and with Jesus right now. And I look and say, he's with Jesus right now. There's mourning and loss for the family, but, but Jeff went from walking with Jesus in this life to walking with Jesus face to face, like that. Why do I know that? Because our God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And over all time and all eternity, He is sovereign. And from the moment you wake up to the time you place your head on your pillow, and even while you sleep, He is with you. He is God. This vastness of God, Alpha and Omega, first and the last, beginning and end, spans every day of your life. Every day of your life, God's arms are wrapped around it. When you wake up in the morning, when you look in the mirror and start brushing your teeth, God is there. Do you know that? Do you recognize his presence? When you interact with people in your home or when you're in your home by yourself, you're not alone. God is there. When you're at work or on a Zoom call and, and just and going through stuff, God is there. He's with you. When you relax at the end of an evening and turn on your computer or your TV and spend that time kind of winding down, if you do that, God is there too. That could be good news or bad news, but God is there. I remember one of the things my dad told my wife Sherry in one of their many spiritual conversations is he said, well, one of the reasons I kind of, I'm kind of cautious about the whole God thing is the idea of a God who's always there and always around and always watching me. I don't remember how he says, it just kind of bothers me. Somebody's always watching me. <laughs> well, yeah, that can be bothersome at times with the choices we make. But it's also wonderful to know that somebody's always watching you and you're never alone. Even to the moment you fall asleep, 
When you doze off and you're done for the day. And while you're sleeping, he's there and he's with you. And I thought about this just, the, just, just recently because the last time we were able to be in Michigan with our kids and with our grandkids, um, I got to tuck Cohen into bed one night. And that was like a, a special little privilege. And I got him in bed and I was kind of patting on him and trying to sing him, Jesus loves me. And he says, he says, he says, he says will you hold me, Pa? Will you hold me, Pa? So I said, sure. So he's got a little, little uh, glider rocker in the room. So, I, so everybody else went out of the room and I just took him and put him you know, on, my, on my shoulder here and just patting his back and rocking and singing a little song. And after a while, he's just completely still. So I stopped rocking and stopped patting. And I said, okay, now it's time to go to the bed. And then he pulls back off my shoulder and looks at me. It's like, Pa, I'm still awake. I'm like, okay. So I said, okay, put your head down. So I'm patting and I'm rocking, I'm patting and I'm rocking. He's, fine. he's just out. I can just tell he's out. So I stop. He leans back and looks at me. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're not done. Okay, okay, buddy, come on, put your And I'm patting and rocking and patting and rocking. And all of a sudden, his head just slumps over off my shoulder like a rag doll, just in one second like that. So I took him and I laid him in his bed. He's got this cool little blue blanket and I pulled his blanket up to his chin. I just looked at him. And I thought, with all that I feel in my heart for this little guy right now, it pales in comparison to what God sees when he looks at you every night when you doze off. He looks at you with such tenderness and affection and care. And he says, that's my little girl. If you're in your 90s, you're still his little girl because he's infinite. That's my boy. And while you sleep, he watches over you because he is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And all of your life and all of your days and all of your experiences are under his sovereign care. He is God. Everywhere you go, He is with you. Everywhere you go, whether you're going to church like this or you're going to visit a friend who's hurting, He's there. Whether you're going to a bar or you're going to Baskin Robbins, He's there. Because both can be addictive. Um, whether you're drive, if you're driving in your car at the speed limit or slightly above it, He's there. Everything you experience, all that you do, He's there. There's nothing you do in all your life in the moments where you're, you wonder, is God with me? And you wish he was and you can't feel him, but you can know he's there. In the moments where you say, I hope God's not watching a part of this. He's there too. In all things, he is with you. Why? Because he is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. If you want to memorize a Bible verse, memorize Revelation 23, 22, 13, because you should have it by now. Do you know and believe and live with confidence? that you're never alone. He's always with you. In the middle of a pandemic, he's with you. When the political world is upside down, sideways, and spinning out of control, he is with you, he is with you, he is with you. Always. That's our God. If you're away to college and trying to figure out the whole, what does my faith look like when I'm out of town, out of sight, and out of a Christian kind of family home. He's there every step, every moment, all the time. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever time it is, early, late, middle of the day, he's with you. What's in a name? Well, one of God's names, and God says, I am, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I am the first and I'm the last. I am the beginning and I am the end. And I am everything in between. That should give us comfort, encouragement, hope, peace. And if you've found yourself the last 24 hours or the last 300 days fixating and focusing on all that's wrong and all the turmoil and all the questions and all, all the conflicts and all that, that you can't, fit and put together and all that seems out of control. And if you, the more you fixate on that, the more you forget who's on the throne. And I want to say one more time, we don't forget what's happening around us. We have to be aware. We have to pray. We have to engage, do all we can to make a difference in every aspect of life. But when you find yourself fixating on those things to where your heart is racing and, 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 you, and you find yourself anxious and nervous and hopeless and discouraged and depressed, then just turn your eyes up. 
Turn, turn to Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. Or commit it to memory. And just say, oh God, you are the one who declares. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. Oh God, we pray right now that you will reveal yourself to us as the one who rules and reigns over all things, over all the universe, over the little tiny details of our lives that don't seem that important and remind us that you rule and you reign over the biggest of things that we can't control and we can't understand and we can't put the pieces together. But God, you are on the throne. I pray that you will remind us tonight that you, our God, Alpha, Omega, first and last, beginning and end, that you are on the throne and your kingdom never ends. God, your kingdom never ends. And Jesus, you revealed your power and you revealed the glory of heaven when you came and walked on this earth, when you lived a life with no sin and you gave your life for our sins. And Jesus, before you did that, you, Jesus, sat with your followers and you instituted this meal that we're about to share together. We call it communion, a remembrance of who you are and what you've done. So Jesus, meet us now in this time as we meet with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On your way in here in the courtyard in the car, somebody should have brought you or handed you a little communion cup. If you didn't get one, would you just raise your hand and hold it up? And so if you want to partake of communion and someone will kind of walk around and bring one to you now and make sure folks that have those are looking in the cars as well. Just raise your hand out of your car if, you, if we missed you somehow coming in. And I want to encourage you, if you have one of those little cups, if you're at home right now, would you right now just take, take a moment and grab uh, a cracker, some bread, uh, some juice, some wine, whatever you prefer, and get that with you? so that we can partake together in just a moment. And if you're here in the, in the courtyard or in your cars, just right now, would you, it's kind of tricky and we don't like doing communion this way. We won't as soon as we don't have to, but with COVID, we have to be very careful. But you're, you're gonna find you can peel off a little top and there's a little wafer and you're gonna peel off another thing and you've got your juice. And if you could carefully do that, if you're wearing gloves, uh, take them off because you won't be able to do it with gloves on. It's tricky, but peel off the top one, get the wafer, peel off the other one, have the juice open already and put the wafer in one hand, the juice in the other hand so you can partake with us. So as you're doing that, and uh, Greg and I are going to uh, prepare you to come to the table. And uh, we're going to officially pray for Greg in a couple of weeks on a Sunday morning. Uh, but as of the first of the year, Greg become one of the pastors on our team. And so somebody said, well, who should help you with communion? And I said, hey, you throw the kid in the deep end and get him swimming, right? And so, no, I'm so glad, Greg, Pastor Greg, to, to share in communion with you and to lead with you. So will you prepare your hearts as we look at God's word from 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we prepare to come to the table, the question is why? Why, why are we holding this wafer? Or why are we holding this little cup? Why are we partaking together? Because Jesus said, remember me. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our, our, our feast of remembrance of what Jesus has done for us and who he is. As you partake of this, I encourage you to do it with awe and wonder. Just to think to yourself that the God of heaven would leave glory, come to this earth, give his life for me, and give me a reminder of the greatness of his love and the price he paid. We should be in awe and wonder of who he is. If you're joining us right now in the courtyard, in your car, or at home, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've come to the cross, you've received him, he is your Lord and the leader of your life, we invite you to partake with us. This is not the, this is not the, the cup and the bread of Shoreline Church. This is the table of Jesus. And so if you're a Jesus follower, this table is for you, and we invite you to partake. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, 
then just refrain from partaking. That's fine. But watch those around you or just kind of watch what's going on because this is, this is such a deep part of our spiritual lives. And if you have questions about this, talk with me or another pastor after the service and say, tell me more about that communion thing or call the church. We'd love to talk with you about what this means and why we do it. And for those of you that are at home, I hope you have your, your, your drink and your, and your bread or your cracker. And here in the courtyard, I hope you're, you're prepared. And at this time, we're just going to prepare our hearts to partake of the elements. This bread reminds us of the broken body of Jesus. With this bread, we remember the life of Jesus, that he chose to leave heaven and dwell among us, that he lived a perfect and blameless life, and we remember the sacrifice that he made, that he had his body broken so that we could be made whole through the forgiveness of sin. And with this bread, we remember his faithfulness throughout this year. 2020 can only be summed up as an incredibly difficult year. But we know that Jesus never left. And that he continues to provide us with peace and comfort and strength and wisdom so we can rejoice knowing that Jesus is here now with us. So let us partake in this bread together remembering the grace of Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for your broken body so that we could be made whole. Lord, thank you for your, your continued faithfulness season after season, year after year. And Lord, we say thank you for your daily provision. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. And the cup which we bless is our communion with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As you hold the cup, as you think about this reminder, this physical reminder of the spiritual reality, that, that by his wounds, the prophet Isaiah said, we are healed. That, that when we're told that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, that Jesus said, I'll take it. I'll do it. I'll die for them. This cup reminds us that he willingly took the cross. So remember his life, his love for children, his care for the hurting and the broken and the outcast. Remember the life of Jesus. Remember his death. That on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. On the cross, he said, it is finished. Remember his death that he said, it is finished and died. Remember his resurrection and his glory, his ascension to heaven. And remember that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he is with us. Let's partake of the cup together. Lord Jesus, we give you praise. Savior, good shepherd, lover of our souls, word of God. We receive this gift. Fill us up in our hearts and our souls with your presence in a fresh way. And Jesus, as we now respond with songs of praise, of worship to you, be glorified. You deserve the praise that we can give and so much more. So unleash our hearts and our voices to glorify you. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your sake. Amen.